For almost 30 years, Cartoon Network has produced a variety of beloved shows. Whether it be 90s classics like Ed, Ed and Eddie or modern hits such as Regular Show, there is something for everyone. The same can also be said for the network's animated movies. While they aren't on the quality of Disney or Pixar, these movies, typically based on their more popular shows, are still beloved by fans. This is why today we'll be looking at these movies and deciding which ones are the best and the worst. Hey guys, I'm Brad with Wicked Binge, and this is Cartoon Network Movies Worst to Best. First, let's set a few rules. We aren't looking at only how enjoyable the movies are, but how well the crew took advantage of the opportunities the film format gave them. In addition, we are only going to look at films based on Cartoon Network original series. In other words, this list will have none of the DC, Hanna-Barbera, or live-action properties that aired on the network. Sorry to all of the fans of Reanimated. With that out of the way, let's begin. Alright, you know the drill. But if you don't, we'll be starting with the worst movies and then working our way up to the best. The worst film is 2011's Johnny Bravo Goes to Bollywood. The plot of the film is self-explanatory. Johnny Bravo, hungry for success, decides to make it big in Bollywood but soon finds out things are harder than expected. This is definitely an obscurity among the many Cartoon Network movies made, and plenty of you probably didn't know about this movie until now. Johnny Bravo was popular in India, where it still sees reruns to this day. As a result of this popularity, Cartoon Network commissioned an animated movie aimed at the territory, and even got the cast and series creator Van Partible back for the ride. Sadly, there isn't much interesting about this film other than its mere existence. Johnny Bravo Goes to Bollywood is a slog. Most of the jokes are nothing more than pop culture references and overused ones at that. Wow, a Twilight joke? I mean, nobody did that in 2011. The story feels like it has the potential for great humor and situations, but the film never takes advantage. You honestly forget this film is even set in Bollywood, and it begins to feel more like a setup episode smashed together. To say this film doesn't take advantage of its format would be an understatement. However, the worst sin of this movie is that we can't even recommend it to the fans of the show. With all the following movies, even the worst ones, we can at least see it entertaining die-hard fans. This one will leave fans disappointed. There isn't much to say. It's a shame that everyone's favorite hunk came back only to go out on a sour note. But there's nothing to do about that. Fans have often wondered why Cartoon Network never acknowledged the existence of this film, but once you see it, it's easy to see why Cartoon Network would rather leave it in the past. Next is My Gym Partner's A Monkey, The Big Field Trip. Airing in 2007, this movie follows the students at Charles Darwin Middle School, who are on their way to the titular Big Field Trip. After Adam, the only human in the school, plays his piccolo, the animals on the bus fall asleep. The bus goes out of control, leaving them stranded in the woods. Both the students and faculty must survive the perils of the wilderness and get to their destination. My Gym Partner's a Monkey was never one of Cartoon Network's greatest shows, so it's fitting that its TV movie is one of their weakest. The premise sounds like it would work well as a movie, and it could put the characters into a great adventure scenario. Unfortunately, there's little adventure. They stay in the same area of the woods. Early on, you get the sense that this could have easily been a regular episode, something that becomes a theme for the weaker movies on this list. Maybe it's for the best, as Jim Partner was always more comedic than adventurous. That then begs the question, does the humor deliver? <laughs> nah, it's forgettable, with not a single joke standing out. The humor can be summed up by the twist at the end. We'd say, spoiler alert, but we doubt any of you will see this film. What's the destination of this big field trip? A big field, of course. Truly, it's peak comedy. The big field trip is sure to please fans of the series, but there's little that will entertain anybody else. You're better off taking a big field trip of your own. Next is 2020's Ben 10 vs. The Universe. Picking up on the 2016 reboot series, the movie follows Ben Tennyson as he enters outer space and uncovers the history of the Omnitrix. Meanwhile, his greatest foe, Vilgax, reappears, hungry to take over the Earth. The adventure takes Ben all over the universe as he tries desperately to save it from Vilgax's wrath. Ben 10 vs. the Universe isn't bad, but it is dull. This is the third film based on the Ben 10 franchise, but it brings barely anything new. You'll see other shows on this list that had just as many movies as this franchise, so you wonder why these films retread so much of the same ground. There's nothing that wasn't done better in those movies either. If you've seen the other two movies in the franchise, then you more or less have seen this one. 
a focus on the Omnitrix and its creator, that was the main focus of the first movie. A subplot involving Gwen and Grandpa Max trying to find Ben, that was a plot line in the second movie. Even the occasional new story element, like Vilgax being an apprentice of Asmuth, do little to make it fresh. About the only thing we can recommend this movie on is if you're a big fan of Kevin Eleven, as this was the only movie he's ever appeared in. Unsurprisingly, it also makes him one of the film's highlights. Beyond that, you're better off giving the other two Ben 10 movies a shot, as you'll find a lot more entertainment. Summertime has arrived with Camp Laszlo, Where's Laszlo? This film acts as a prequel to the series. After Laszlo gets lost and miss an encounter with the bear, Raj reflects on the events that led up to this point, including the first time he met his jelly cabin roommates, Laszlo and Clam. Where's Laszlo feels like it has an interesting premise. Unfortunately, it's the execution where things go wrong. Camp Laszlo, with its strange characters who yearn for adventure, seems like a perfect fit for an adventure film. Sadly, that's not what we get. It's another one of those movies that feel like a few episodes edited together type of TV movie. It has the same pace and structure as a standard episode, and the movie is worse because of it. A film about the Jelly Cabin trio going on this grand adventure feels like the most logical storyline to choose from. Instead, what we get doesn't feel any more special than a standard episode. There's even a subplot about Laszlo struggling to fit into the camp that feels like it could have been good drama, but the movie never goes for it. Camp Laszlo was known for its humor and wacky characters, but this is a movie. Why not delve deeper into the characters in a way an 11-minute episode wouldn't be able to? Other shows on this list had no problem doing that, and some of those are wackier than Camp Laszlo. I mean, it's still entertaining, even if it doesn't use the movie format to its fullest. There's good comedy, and the movie still oozes the charm of its series. And it also won an Emmy, for what it's worth. Where's Laszlo feels like a missed opportunity, and that's why it gets this spot on the list. Next is 2012's Ben 10 Destroy All Aliens. Taking place a year after the events of the original series, this CG animated movie focuses on Ben being thrusted into a new adventure by the space mercenary Tetrax. It involves encounters with new aliens and foes. After Ben's Omnitrix malfunctions and teleports him all over the world, he must seek out its creator for assistance. However, he's not the only one looking for him. Along the way, Ben is attacked by a hunter who's also searching for the creator. Ben must not only get the Omnitrix fixed, but also learn the identity of his attacker. Destroy All Aliens has a lot of good going for it, but the same can be said about its flaws. There's a lot of action, so much so that it's overwhelming. As soon as one action scene ends, another one takes its place. This is not a film that you'll find boring. The story also has intrigue. There's mystery to the identity of Ben's Hunter, and the reveal is sure to shock fans. Now let's get into the flaws. The CG has not aged well. Maybe this art style isn't fit for 3D animation, but it's an eyesore. Being CG also means it is plagued with many of the other issues that come with it, most notably being a lack of extras in the film's backgrounds. Say what you will about either of the other Ben 10 movies, but they at least look better than this. The film also falls into some of the same trappings as the previous Ben 10 movie we looked at. It shares a lot of DNA with the first movie, Secret of the Omnitrix, which makes this feel like a pale imitation. If you're not a huge Ben 10 fan or just want to see the best film based on the series, stay tuned. But if you're a diehard fan, you might see some value in this often overlooked entry in the Ben 10 universe. Next is 2007's Wrath of the Spider Queen. A familiar face from Grimm's past, the Spider Queen arrives to take revenge on Grimm. Meanwhile, Billy begins to accept Jeff the Spider as his son. Wrath of the Spider Queen is fun, but a few things hold it back from being in the same league as the other movies based on the series. Let's start with the good. This film will keep you laughing. It feels like every minute has a line or visual gag that makes you laugh. There is even character development, as small as it may be. We delve into Grimm's past, and as mentioned earlier, Billy overcomes his fear of spiders. The new antagonist, the Spider Queen, is a fun addition to the show's already beloved cast. Unfortunately, the film is held back by its format. This is intended to be a movie, but it feels more like a special. Even streaming services like HBO Max list it as a two-part special, which is what it was probably intended to be. When you view it like that, it's entertaining. As a movie, however, it's lacking. The story is cramped by the short runtime and a lack of scope. It doesn't help when it's sandwiched between the two other Billy and Mandy films, both of which are definitely more entertaining. Wrath of the Spider Queen is the weakest film based on the Grimm adventures. However, it's still entertaining, earning its spot on the list. Our next entry is 2020's We Bear Bear the Movies. 
The movie follows the three brothers Grizz, Ice, and Panda, banished from their home in San Francisco after numerous instances of upsetting the community. They look to Canada for refuge, and along the way, face many obstacles. We Bear Bears isn't the best or most exciting film on this list, but it does a lot right. There's a good sense of adventure, though it never gets too crazy. It's the right balance. For a show this grounded, it can only get so wild. For fans of the show, a few familiar faces will make you feel right at home. Even if you don't know the show, this is one of the more accessible films on this list. We also have to praise this movie for having heart. It zeroes in on the relationship between the bears, and it's more character work than any 11-minute episode could offer. You get a feel for the relationship between these three bears, who really are family. It tackles themes of acceptance and family. It isn't a deep dive, but it's something none of the films up to this point have done. We have to give the creators credit for tackling something not many films on this list even try to do. We Bear Bears is not flawless. It lacks excitement, but it's a good time nonetheless. If you have ever wanted to give these bears a chance, there's no better place to start than here. Next is Kids Next Door movie, Operation Interviews. This 2008 movie serves as the finale to the story of the K&D. It focuses on the members of Sector V as they undergo a scavenger hunt that brings the K&D and their villains together. Operation Interviews works well as a finale to the K&D, but not so much as a movie. The movie has pretty much everything you would want in the finale, and this we get to see Sector V go on one final adventure. It's not just the last adventure either, it's a legitimate final mission. You even get strange live-action segments that feature the cast from the show as adults, and the actors actually do a great job matching the characters. The movie is also emotional, especially the final minutes. Even though it's a finale, the show leaves things open for a follow-up with plenty of new reveals and twists to surprise fans. The biggest problem is there isn't more of it, which goes back to our initial critique of the film not really feeling like one. If there was an extra 20 minutes and a grander scope, it would have easily cracked the top 10. Sadly, it's limited by the budget of a regular TV episode. Still, this TV movie ends the show on a bittersweet note, feeling like a natural ending, while also leaving the door open for more from this universe. Now, if only Cartoon Network would greenlight Galactic Kids Next Door. Next is 2006 Good Wilt Hunting. It's a special day that comes once every five years to Fosters, when imaginary friends get a chance to reunite with their creators. Unfortunately for Wilt, his creator has never shown up to the celebration. Wilt decides to run away, and the other Foster's friends search for him. Good Wilt Hunting doesn't match other films based on the show in terms of imagination or fun, but it remains a high point for the series. This movie is Wilt's moment in the spotlight, and we learn a lot about him. He's not the only one we get to learn about either. We also learn about the origins of other imaginary friends, which leads to plenty of reveals in store for fans. It's the right choice for this TV movie, especially considering how the show tended to focus on Mac and Blue more than anyone else. Wilt's story is engaging. The movie is surprisingly light on jokes and gags, and focuses more on Wilt's personal conflict. It's a bold choice, and one we applaud. However, this is another case of a TV movie being hamstrung by resembling a two-parter more than an actual movie. It works well in that format, but it's not up to par with other Foster's movies. While it's the weakest film from the series, it still has heart and imagination, and we think Wilt will be okay with that. Next, we have another Billy and Mandy movie, 2008's Underfist Halloween Bash. Halloween has arrived in Endsville, and with it comes an army of evil treats. Only a collection of Billy and Mandy side characters can save the day, forming the superhero group Underfist. The team consists of the Spectral Exterminator, Host Delgado, Jeff the Spider, General Scar, Fred Fredberger, and the part nerd, part vampire, part mummy, Irwin. Underfist is an interesting movie in that it's not so much a Billy and Mandy movie as it's an Underfist pilot. Underfist was initially intended as the beginning of the all-new series. Sadly, as a result of both new management at CN and creator Maxwell Adams' contract expiring, the series only exists as this one-hour special. It's a shame, as Underfist is a lot of fun. The movie does an exceptional job feeling distinct from other Billy and Mandy movies. This one is focused on action and adventure, leading to fun sequences. The action is more engaging than anything in Billy and Mandy, giving the film a vibe, unlike anything that came before in the series. Despite the movie's focus on characters who were punchlines in the original show, like Irwin and Fred Fredberger, the movie does a good job deepening the characters. You get a better sense of who these characters are, with Irwin in particular getting a lot of development. The focus on character and action doesn't mean this movie is joke-free. If you love the offbeat and demented humor of its parent series, then you'll love this. 
It isn't higher on this list because we wish there was more of it. It's baffling that Cartoon Network didn't go through with this as a series. It would have fit with many of their shows in the late 2000s. Sadly, we only have this one movie, but what a movie. If you can track it down, give it a watch ASAP. Now we have the best Ben 10 movie, Secret of the Omnitrix. Airing in 2007, this movie acts as a finale to the original Ben 10 story. Interestingly, the movie aired several months before the final episodes, despite taking place after them chronologically. Things are going as usual for Ben and his crime-fighting life, until a battle damages the Omnitrix, setting it into self-destruct mode. Ben must find the creator of the Omnitrix, or else risk the destruction of everyone and everything he cares about. Secret of the Omnitrix is the perfect movie for the franchise. It has fun action scenes, plot twists, and high stakes. New characters are introduced, and a new alien is added to the Omnitrix. The film does a good job raising the stakes, with Ben's Omnitrix troubles having the potential to destroy everything. Every time Ben uses the Omnitrix, he risks the possibility of a disaster. You never believe Ben is going to die, but still you wonder what the ramifications of this will have on the story going forward. The movie gives Ben a good character arc, putting him to the greatest test in his superhero career thus far. The original show would have always have Ben learned some lesson by the end of each episode, however, this movie takes that to the most extreme possible scenario. Ben's recklessness isn't just going to get him self hurt, but everyone he's ever loved. Alright, it isn't entirely gloom and doom. You still have all the action and quirkiness, but it's used far more appropriately. Overall, if you're to watch one movie in the Ben 10 universe, it's this one. Or you can check out those weird live action movies. Actually, on second thought, don't do that. Next is House of Blues. The movie introduces us to the Foster's family, namely Mac and his imaginary friend, Blue. After Mac's mom believes he's too old for an imaginary friend, Mac takes Blue to Foster's. His condition is that Blue will be kept from being adopted so long as he visits every day. Along the way, the duo makes new friends, new enemies, and struggle to keep their friendship intact. House of Blues is a delight. As a pilot, it does everything it needs to do. The world is established, we get to know the characters, and the tone of the show is set. Even though this is only the first episode, the Foster's house never feels bigger than here. You get a sense of scale for it that is unlike anything the show does. There's a fun scene that quickly goes through the entire house, and for several of these places, it is the only time we get to see them. The characters are likable. From the first scene they appear in, you understand what kind of character they are. At the heart of this pilot is the relationship between Mac and Blue. You buy them as friends, and you want to see them prevail against whatever obstacles in their way. The scenes in which Blue awaits Mac's arrival to the house do a great job displaying how much they care about each other, and with minimal dialogue. From this relationship, the audience understands the core theme of Foster's, that being friendship. Throughout its six seasons, the show never abandoned these themes, and that all began with this movie. If you're interested in this series, there really is no better place to start than the beginning. Next is Cartoon Network's first TV movie, Dexter's Laboratory Ego Trip. Originally intended as the finale for the series, it tells the tale of Dexter traveling through time and meeting his future versions. In the end, four Dexters must unite to save the world from a future ruled by Dexter's rival, Mandark. As the original ending to the series, Ego Trip ends it on an epic note. Dexter faces his greatest challenge, and does so alongside three other Dexters. Despite them all literally being the same, the creators make them into completely unique characters, whether it be the cowardly number 12 or the macho superhero Dexter. It's also interesting to see elements that are similar to creator Gendy Tartakovsky's following series, Samurai Jack. The first 20 minutes are nearly devoid of dialogue, letting the action build up naturally. Also like Jack, action is the main focus. While its action scenes aren't on that level, it leads to great set pieces, and of course, the plot involves stopping a villain from taking over the world in the future. Some might call that unoriginal, but it is a great way of showing how different these two shows are, despite being from the same creator. The movie takes the Dexter we know and love and dials it up to 11, making for a movie that works on its own. It also feels like a proper movie for the fans of the beloved TV series. If only the series had actually ended here like it was meant to. Next is 2007's Big Boogie Adventure. When Grimm and friends fail to reap the soul of General Scar, things begin to go from bad to worse for the Reaper. The fallout from this leads the group to a trial in the underworld. Grimm's old rival, the Boogeyman, claims Grimm is not suited for the role of Grim Reaper, for all the instances he has lost a scythe. Grimm ultimately loses his powers, but hope is not completely lost. After the group escapes Boogie's clutches, a race begins to capture Horror's hand. 
This artifact will make its owner the scariest alive. Big Boogie Adventure takes the world of the series and somehow makes it even crazier in a fun adventure setting. The humor is more random, the characters zanier, and even the story's different. We didn't even mention that there is a time travel subplot where robot versions of Billy and Mandy are sent back in time to stop an apocalyptic event. It doesn't go anywhere, but it's something that only the TV movie format could have done. The movie even delves deeper into the characters. While the characters bicker and argue, the movie shows us that they care for each other. They feel like friends. And that extends to the wannabe ruler, Mandy. What also helps is that each of the characters gets a moment in the limelight, whether it be Billy's singing of the song scary -O, or Irwin's stand against a group of pirates. Overall, Big Boogie Adventure is the perfect movie for a show like Billy and Mandy. If you were to watch just one movie based on the series, it should definitely be this one. It's certainly a better fate than walking the plank, that's for sure. We're going back to the past with 2001's Samurai Jack, the premiere movie. As another pilot movie, it's basically the intro to the series, extended to 60 minutes. After years of training, Jack faces off against the shapeshifter Aku. Just as things look to go in his favor, the Shogun of Sorrow teleports Jack into the far-off future. Jack arrives in a time unlike his own, but his mission to destroy Aku remains the same. Just like the Foster's pilot, Samurai Jack excels at giving the viewers a taste of what is to come. However, we have to give Jack the edge, if only for telling a more focused story. Both Jack and Aku immediately prove to be compelling heroes and villains, respectively. This is thanks not only to the wonderful performances of Phil Lamar and the late Mako, but also the characters are engaging. Aku is a villain who means business, while you empathize with Jack's mission and want to see him succeed. It's important that we care about Jack, as not only is he the main character, but his quest is also the focus of the series. If we don't care about his quest to get back to the past, then why watch? It's a testament to the team's talent. They made us care for both Jack and his quest in only an hour and with little dialogue. We also have to give big props to the climactic action sequence, seeing Jack go up against the horde of Beetleborgs. Jack takes a beating, which only adds to the tension and intensity. It's the perfect sequence to summarize the show. Action-packed, intense, and unlike any cartoon ever seen on TV. It's a perfect prelude for the series, and we can't fault something for being honest, can we? Next is 2008's Destination Imagination. Things are stressful for Frankie. When a mysterious new imaginary friend encased in a chest is brought to the home, Frankie enters the chest, discovering a new world. With her attention occupied, the house falls into chaos. It's up to Mac, Blue, and the rest of the gang to find Frankie and restore some sanity to the home. As the third Foster's home movie, it could have been very likely for them to run out of steam. Thankfully, the crew saved the best for last. Destination Imagination is as fun as the best episodes, and definitely the best movie. While the other two movies were light on character development, this movie goes harder. Any fans of the show will be well aware of how much strife Frankie goes through, and this movie is her time to shine. The same is also true of Mr. Harriman. Both get the chance to grow, making them the most interesting they've ever been, and leading to some interesting interactions. The sequences in the Chess's imaginary world is a show at its most imaginative, and there's always something new. During the final minutes, where the world begins to fall apart, are interesting from an artistic standpoint. It stands out from the ordinary locations in the series. As one of the final pieces of Foster's media produced before it came to an end, Destination Imagination proves that Foster's retained their creativity for six seasons, and that's no small feat. With such a great accomplishment, the movie deserves this spot on the list. We're going back to the world of the K&D with Operation Zero. After a battle between the K&D and adults, the villainous father gets a hold of the K&D recommissioning module and uses it to rejuvenate the K&D's greatest villain, Grandfather. After he awakens, Grandfather turns children and adults into senior zombies. The only people that stand between him and world domination are number one and number zero. As the first movie set in the K&D world, Operation Zero feels like an epic story fitting the TV movie format. It's the most dangerous fight the group has ever found themselves in, and the movie gets that across. For fans, this will be a treat. Every major candy operative and supervillain appears, even for a few seconds. It goes a long way at making the movie feel like an event that is unlike anything in the series. There are also twists and turns from introducing new characters to the good old I'm your father twist. However, what is at the heart of this movie is a character study for number one. This is his movie. It shows why he is the leader of Sector V. He's also mostly alone in this adventure, which drives home the focus on him. However, a hero is only as good as his villain. 
Grandfather proves his title as the KD's greatest nemesis. He's intimidating, and he owns the screen every time. This is also his only appearance, which feeds back into our point about this film feeling like an event. While Kids Next Door would continue for another season after this movie's release, no other story captured the scope of this movie. If you were to watch one piece of media based on this series, it must be this one. We're sure you'll enjoy it. The next movie is interesting, as it is the only film made for theaters, the Powerpuff Girls movie. Released in 2002, the movie is the origin story for the crime-fighting trio. However, that's not to say this movie is nothing more of an extended version of the show's intro. The movie also introduces a large story element to the girls' origin, that Mojo Jojo was partially responsible for their creation. While some might see it as an unnecessary way of connecting the antagonist to the heroes, we see it as a good way to create more of a relationship between the two. You must admit that it will forever change how you looked at scenes between them in the earlier episodes. Upon its release, the Powerpuff Girls movie received mixed reviews from critics and was a bomb financially. Maybe releasing it the same summer as Lilo and Stitch, Star Wars Episode II and Spider-Man wasn't the best idea? Regardless, the film's failure killed all plans for future CN theatrical movies. Nearly two decades later, we have yet to see a movie in theaters based on one of their original series. It's unfair, as the Powerpuff Girls movie is one of the strongest CN films. The animation is stellar, and it's the best-looking movie in the entire list. It was a theatrical film, after all. The action is also a highlight, having speed and intensity. The movie is also surprisingly dour. Some see the movie as trying too hard to be mature, but it uses the tone in a more interesting way than people give it credit. Throughout the show, the girls are always chastised for destroying the city and being bug-eyed freaks. It makes perfect sense for an origin movie to showcase their tragedy, as melodramatic as it can sometimes feel. The Powerpuff Girls movie may not be everyone's cup of tea, and its tone can alienate fans, but this is a case where the good outweighs the bad. We can all agree on one thing, it is way better than the 2016 series. In third place, we have regular show The Movie. The film follows Mordecai, Rigby, and the rest of their co-workers as they go back in time to save the universe from its greatest evil, a volleyball coach. Along the way, Mordecai and Rigby's friendship is put to the ultimate test, as secrets are revealed that could change their relationship forever. Yes, this is the fourth movie on this list to involve time travel. But who could say this doesn't fit regular show? As you can guess from the storyline, regular show the movie has absurdity and heart. This film excels at using a grand story as a perfect backdrop for some character drama. While it has a giant sci-fi story, the real focus is on the relationship between Mordecai and Rigby. They're put through a lot, especially when one of them is partially responsible for kicking off the story. It fits both the story and what we expect from the show. Also, this movie has surprisingly enjoyable action scenes. I mean, it's no Samurai Jack, but the opening scene will get you hooked. Regular show the movie can feel like an extended episode, but it's fun, so it doesn't hurt. If anyone wants to see all the regular show hubbub, then this movie is a perfect starting point. The silver medal goes to 2019's Steven Universe The Movie. Taking place two years after the original series, Steven returns to his home, ready for happily ever after. Unfortunately for him, the mysterious new gem Spinel has other plans. Spinel resets the crystal gems and devises a plan to destroy the Earth. Steven must now save his friends, his home, and discover the secrets of this mysterious figure from his mother's past. Steven Universe The Movie is one of our favorite among the many Cartoon Network movies. For one, the soundtrack is catchy. The last season was rather light on memorable musical numbers, and after seeing this movie, one can see why. It's as if they saved their best for this, which is commendable. The new addition to the show's cast, Spinel, is memorable. The rubber hose style animation makes her stand out, and you become interested in her story. It's a shame she wasn't used more frequently in the sequel series. There are also lovely animated sequences, with the moments done by legendary animator Takafumi Hori. If we have any problem with the movie, the recapping of several character storylines can be tiresome. However, it can also be argued that it is necessary to show how far the characters have come. Even so, it feels like it handicaps the creative energy. Regardless, Steven Universe the movie is sure to delight both fans and newcomers. Check it out. So what could possibly earn first place? In our eyes, it should be a movie that doesn't only use the film format to its advantage, but also one that uses it to tell a story you'd never expect. Regular show or like Steven Universe, they're both good, but they didn't do that. That, however, cannot be said for Ed, Ed and Eddie's Big Picture Show. The finale to the series follows the Eds as they escape to find Eddie's big brother after a scam went terribly wrong. 
However, the other kids in the cul-de-sac are not far behind and are primed to exact revenge. Big Picture Show is an Ed, Ed and Eddie story that could have only been done in a movie. The film is surprisingly small in the slapsticking comedy. The movie is reserved and character-centric, which is best seen in the film's opening. No music, dialogue, or quirky sound effects. Instead, we're treated to the ambiance of the cul-de-sac, alongside images of the abandoned area. And there are plenty of emotional moments, like when Double D almost loses his friends in quicksand. You get the sense from the movie that they are best friends, even with how often they were at odds in the original series. The rest of the cast don't get nearly as much development, but we at least see them often. After all, it is the end of the series. It'd be a shame if someone were left to the curb. And, of course, there is a reveal a decade in the making. The reveal of Eddie's brother, the first new character since the show began. Big Picture Show earns our top spot for simultaneously being everything you'd want and everything you never knew you wanted. Besides, which movie on this list has Captain Melonhead? Yep, didn't think so. Alright, that's the list. Let us know in the comments section which Cartoon Network movie is the best you've seen, and tell us what we should cover next. Remember to hit that notification bell and binge more of our videos, but most importantly, stay wicked.